welcome everyone uh, to the Friends of Villa Terrace annual Spring Garden Lecture Series, always on Wednesday evenings in March and April, and our first virtual series. This is thanks to the tech geniuses on our volunteer board, uh, Megan Holbrook and Nicole Watson. And thanks also to our garden lecture committee members, Jennifer Current and Ellen Erian. We are so privileged to welcome Corbin Horn of Kindman Auctions. First, a thank you to our sponsors, Susan Strecker, in loving memory of Barbara Strecker, and Angela Westmore, design build who specializes in creativity for historical properties and new construction. She works with clients to create the perfect setting for their lifestyle. Um, a little housekeeping note, we will be recording tonight's event. And um, to get on to our speaker and Leslie Heinemann, Leslie Heinemann founded her auction house in Chicago in 1982, which grew to be one of the largest auction houses in the United States. In 2018, Leslie Heinemann Auctioneers acquired Cowan's Auction House, founded by Wes Cowan in 1995, creating the foundation for Heinemann Auctions today. Heinemann Auctions is one of the world's leading auction and appraisal firms still headquartered in Chicago. Heinemann is now represented in 13 cities in the United States and operates five sales rooms, more than any other auction house in the country. Heinemann conducts over 100 auctions annually in a wide range of collecting categories, such as fine jewelry, fine art, modern design, books and manuscripts, furniture, decorative arts, couture, Asian works of art, Native American art, and num numismatics, among others. Heinemann also recently launched the Digital Bid Room, their own app, which makes browsing sales and bidding very simple. You can find it in the App Store by searching for Heinemann. Joining us today is Sarah Malloy, Director of Business Development for Heinemann's Milwaukee office and your local contact should you require any assistance. And of course, Corbin Horn. Mr. Horn joined Heinemann in 2009 and he has directed hundreds of sales of important collections, including those of Lily Pulitzer, Lord Anthony and Lady Jacobs, Lars Bolander, and Villa Masai in Lucca, Italy. He has also achieved record results for consignments from institutions including the Toledo Museum of Art, the High Museum of Art, Detroit Institute of Arts, and Minnesota Historical Society. Mr. Horn gives lectures about various topics within the decorative arts to collectors groups and social organizations, and he is a member of the Antiquarian Society of the Art Institute of Chicago and the governing board of the Chicago International Film Festival. And as, on a side note, Mr. Horn also led our incredibly successful live auction for the 2019 Friends of Villa Terrace Gala in the Garden. Please allow us to welcome Corbin Horn. Thank you, very nice introduction, I appreciate it. And I'm sorry that we're not doing this in person this year. It was fun to be there with Sarah last year or was it the year before? I guess it was the year before for the gala in the garden. Let's hope that we can do this in person at the same time next year. Um, we're gonna be talking about living with history and my advice for buying things at auction and furnishing a historic home. This will be very informal. I put some slides together that I am eager to talk to you about, but we'll save questions and answers until the end. And um, I'll remind you to please mute yourself if you're not speaking, uh, if you have not done so already. If So first, let me tell you a little about myself and then I'll tell you about Heinemann's position within the art and antiques market, a little of the basics, sort of an, a buying and selling at auction 101. And then I'll show you examples of some of the historic houses that we've been privileged to work with and sell property from. And I'll show you some examples of the kinds of things that I think you should be looking at if you're looking to match your historic home to what's available on today's market. <clears throat> so I'm a senior specialist at Hindman and I'm the director of all our sales of European furniture and decorative arts across 13 cities in the United States. I'm really, so officially my, my category is Europe from about 1600 to 1850, but I'm really what is known as a generalist, which means Instead of being a true specialist in one specific category, I know a little bit about almost everything. 
Um, my job is very exciting and never boring. I'm very lucky to get to do something super interesting that I love. And my favorite part of the job is going to historic homes all over the country and meeting the people who live in them and collect for them. <clears throat> um, you never know who you're going to meet or what kind of house or what kind of stuff you'll see from day to day. So no two days are ever alike. Let me see if I can share my screen and I'll show you a few things. I always forget how to do this, but it usually comes back to me. One moment. I think this is the one that I want to share. And now I will start from the beginning and we should be all set. I believe everybody can see this. <clears throat> and speak up if you can't see the slides that I'm showing you. So can't a little bit about- oh, No, Corbin, we can't see. No, thank you for saying nope. so. Let me fix that. I need to share this screen. Maybe this is the right one. Here we go. There you go. That's better, right? Thank you. Yep. Um, all right, a little bit about Hindman and how we fit into the auction market globally. So when we talk about auction firms, auction houses, you've all heard of Sotheby's and Christie's, right? They're the two oldest auction firms in the world, founded in the late 1700s, and they serve audiences in every country on earth. Um, Sotheby's and Christie's, while they are renowned and reputable firms, their specialty, they do a great job handling things worth uh, millions and tens of millions of dollars and hundreds of thousands of dollars. As, as great as those firms are and as, as important as they are in the art and antiques market, they're not particularly interested in working with people who have something to sell that is worth $10,000 or $1,000 or $25,000. And that's where our firm fits into the auction market. Sotheby's and Christie's and several other firms like them serve the upper echelon of the market. We are what is known as a middle market auction house and that represents a huge opportunity for our firm in cities all over the US. There are a lot of important and interesting collectibles and works of art that are not being catered to by these two most famous firms in the world. Um, Heinemann was founded in 1982, so we're approaching 40 years old, and the firm has grown tremendously since I've been here. We went from one office in 2009 to 13 offices across the U.S. today. Um, Heinemann has a million different departments and specialties in every category of collecting that you can think of. We have departments and regularly scheduled sales of everything from antiquities, ancient art, to Americana, folk art, the American decorative arts market. We do arms, armor, and militaria, Asian works of art, books and manuscripts, clocks, barometers, and scientific instruments, vintage couture and luxury handbags, European furniture and decorative arts, fine art, both 19th century and earlier, as well as contemporary art. You're looking at an Alexander Calder sculpture right there. We do jewelry and timepieces, both vintage and modern. We do modern design. Native American, prehistoric and tribal art, numismatics, which is the art of coins, if you didn't know, and sports memorabilia, which is a relatively new category for us, but one that has been very successful and is growing rapidly. Um, Hindman, if you don't know, it has an office and a presence in Milwaukee. We have gotten some of our most famous consignments from Milwaukee over the years. You probably have heard the story about the Van Gogh painting that was discovered in an attic in Milwaukee. That was almost 25 or 30 years ago, but Milwaukee is a great town and has always served us well in developing business. Sarah Malloy, who's here on the call and will answer questions at the end, is the business development director who runs our Milwaukee office. We're located downtown on Mason Street across from the Metro Hotel. If you don't know where that is, please come by and see Sarah, but make an appointment first because she's often out of the office going to people's homes and looking at things they want to sell. Um, if, I'm curious if any of you have ever been to an auction before or bought anything or sold anything at an auction. If you have, then some of this will be kind of elementary and I'm sorry for telling you things that you already know, but I, we like to give people a sort of basic introduction to how auctions work because a lot of people have never thought of buying at auction as a way to furnish their own homes or as a way to add to their collections. So many of us rely on dealers and retail outlets and don't realize 
the opportunity and the quality of objects that are available when you shop at auctions. So here are the basics of buying and selling at auction. That's me on the left. And that's one of our auctions in our Chicago sale room. Um, the auction world functions on a consignment business model. We don't buy anything outright. Uh, we, are, we act as brokers for the sellers of the property and we connect them with interested buyers all over the world. We like to say that we serve local audiences, but we connect them with the global audience. So our offices in 13 different cities help people in those regions reach markets all over the world that they would not otherwise have access to. Um, a few of the key terms you need to know when selling something at auction. The word appraisal gets thrown around a lot, and I find that a lot of people misunderstand what appraisal means exactly. Technically, an appraisal is a formal document used by the IRS or insurance companies to evaluate the value of property. There are reasons why you would need to get a formal appraisal document, but what most people don't realize is that you do not need an appraisal to know what something is worth today, nor do you need an appraisal to sell an object at auction. We do provide formal insurance appraisal documents, but you don't always need that. Uh, many people call us and say, I'm looking for an appraisal, but what they actually mean is, I just need a verbal approximation of what this work of art is worth nowadays. We do that for free and we do it all the time and we would love for you to contact us if you need help knowing what something is worth. When I say we work on a consignment business model, consignment means the transfer of property to us from someone who owns the object and we are to act as their agent on the behalf for selling it. Um, it's exactly like real estate. There are brokers who connect the buyers of the property and the sellers of the property. It's a really good analogy to think of us in that way. Each person who sells something with our firm pays a commission. The commission is, it varies, but it's between 10 and 25% and it's negotiated dependent on what kind of property you're selling with us. People who sell things at auction do not owe any fees up front. All the fees are deducted from the sale proceeds if and when the item sells. Let's talk about buying at auction. You, when you read about or attend an auction or read an auction catalog, you'll hear about the lot. Lot means an object or a group of objects which are offered for sale as a single unit. You'll hear the word bid thrown around a lot. A bid is an offer to buy an object for a certain price. Buyer's premium is the commission that the buyer of the items pays. So auction firms make a commission from both the seller of the property and the buyer of the property. The seller's commission is usually a lot lower. The buyer's premium is always 25% and it never changes. So that means that whatever someone agrees to pay for an item at the auction, they will pay 25% on top of that price once they come to pay their invoice. An auction estimate is something that we publish in all of our catalogs. Every object that we're selling has a range, a low estimate and a high estimate. And that range represents where we think things are likely to sell based on the opinion of our specialists and the conditions of the current market. Uh, things can sell for more or things can sell for less. A good guideline is to expect that a third of things will sell for less than the estimate range, a third of things will sell within the estimate range, and a third of things will sell for a lot more than the estimate range. You'll hear the word provenance used a lot, and provenance is highly, highly important and even more important depending on what kind of property you're selling. A provenance is basically a statement that summarizes who owned this object before you. And depending on what you're selling, provenance can have a huge impact on the value of an object. An object with vague provenance can be virtually worthless, whereas an item with really carefully detailed provenance can be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. So when you own something that you think is historically significant, it's important to write down and keep documents related to the provenance so that that information is preserved for future generations. When you're looking at an auction catalog, you'll also see the concept of reserves talked about a lot. A reserve is a minimum price below which the seller of the property does not want to sell it. So you tell us when you're selling something, I don't wanna let this go for less than $5,000. We make that agreement with you. And if bidding on the item ends before your reserve is reached, the object will not be sold. Every auction that we have, and we have hundreds of them a year in different categories, it is published on the internet with an auction catalog. Here's a sample of my department's upcoming auction catalog. The sale takes place in about two weeks. 
In the old days, we published print catalogs for every sale that we had. Nowadays, we don't do that very much. Um, the, the buying and selling world for art and antiques has completely or almost completely moved online. And it's no longer necessary to publish print catalogs to sell something successfully all over the world. So all of our catalogs are published online and look like this. There are links that you can click for each object up for sale and you can look at more pictures of it, inquire online with our specialists to ask more questions about it. And you can register to bid on the object online and I'll tell you more about how that's done on the next couple slides. When someone decides that they love something we have for sale and they want to bid on it, there are several different ways that we let them do that. If you're participating in an auction, you can submit a maximum bid before the sale, that's called an absentee bid. You tell us the most you'd like to pay, we help you get it up to that amount at the lowest price possible. You can also register to have us call you during the auction for a telephone bid. And that way we use one of our employees who is present at the auction to relay your bids to the auctioneer. It's as if you were here, but you're doing it on the phone instead. We also let people bid live on the internet. They can be at home in their pajamas bidding on the computer. Our catalogs are published on several third-party websites that help auction houses connect with buyers all over the world. We also have our own digital bid room, which is a virtual environment where you can participate in the auction without coming to one of our offices. Yes, we still allow people to come in person and sit in the audience like it's a traditional auction. We have not been doing that over the last year, but as soon as COVID is over, we're eager to have auctions live again and enjoy people being in the room with us. Um, so having said all of that and told you the basics about auctions, let me talk to you a little about furnishing a historic home. I'm sure that some of you live in historic houses. Milwaukee is one of my favorite places to come and visit old homes. The houses that you have in the north suburbs of Milwaukee and on the northwest, on the northeast side of downtown Milwaukee are just incredible. Um, my kind of rule of thumb for giving people advice about furnishing a historic home is that you have to let the architecture of the house and the style of the house decide what you put in the house. I can't tell you how many homes I've been to that had nice things in them, but those things were just completely wrong for the style of the house. And I, I have a really funny example I'll show you in a minute, but this is the most important thing to keep in mind when you're working with an interior designer or when you're furnishing your own home. You have to let the house tell you what to buy for it. You can't pick what you love and expect it to look right in the house unless you're very good at collecting. Um, many people love mid-century modern design, but if they don't live in the right house to have mid-century furniture, it's not going to look right. And on the other hand, if you live in a super modern high-rise condo building like a Mies van der Rohe building, we have many of them in Chicago, there's no reason you should have an English sideboard in your dining room. You probably don't even have a dining room if you live in a Mies van der Rohe building. Of course, I have to say that there's an exception to every rule. That there, if, if there's something that you love and it isn't, as I'm saying, quite right for your house, there is a way to make it cool if you know what you're doing. So don't be discouraged if you love something, but I'm telling you it's not right for your house. Um, here's my favorite example of a house that was a, a very, um, efficient collector lived in this house, but that collector was a little misguided and chose the wrong things for this house. We're actually selling this collection in two weeks here in Chicago. This man lived in um, Smithville, Tennessee, which is a pretty small town in the hills, in the hill country of Tennessee, a few hours from Nashville, but he built a big, beautiful timber house, kind of a log cabin palace in the woods, if you will. Um, and this man had several different homes in the US and he loved buying and collecting. He loved European decorative arts, but if you asked me, the way he did it was just not right for a log cabin. We, we were sent pictures of this house because the man passed away and his family needed to sell all of his property. And we said, oh my God, why on earth would someone decorate a log cabin with all this flashy gold, French and European stuff? But if you're like me and you're trained at looking at things, you can see these pictures and mentally remove the items from their setting and see the potential that these objects have. There's a lot of money here in this house and we're gonna sell this whole collection in about a week and a half. Um, another house I love to talk about and we'll, I'll, I'll let you cleanse your eyes from these pictures and I'll show you Swordgate House in Charleston, South Carolina. 
we have an office in Atlanta, Georgia, and we sold the contents of this house last year in our Atlanta sale room. The owners of the house have owned it for about 30 years. They sold it to two music producers from Nashville who want to redecorate it with the help of an interior designer. So one of the services that we offered to them before we even began selling the objects and moving them out of the house was to walk around the house with them and um, give them our advice about what they should keep and what they should sell. That's another one of the consulting services that we offer. Our specialists are experienced in so many different categories that we can give people good advice and say, that chandelier is good for this house because it's probably the type of chandelier that would have been there when it was built. Or we might say, no, that sofa is completely wrong for this room. You should sell it because you can do better. I love to talk about this house because it's called Swordgate House because of its famous iron gates around the wall that borders the front of it. Charleston, if you've been there, you know is famous for its ironwork that's on the facade of buildings and fences all over town. A lot of German immigrants made their way to Charleston in the 18th and 19th century, much like they did in Milwaukee. And the Germans did such good metal work that you see gates like this all over town. I like to connect this to Milwaukee because you have phenomenal Cyril Kolnick ironwork at the Villa Terrace Museum. And um, you have the best, the biggest and best variety of it of anywhere I've seen. We sold a Cyril Kolnick gate just a couple of years ago from a house in Milwaukee. This is it. Um, it was, uh, we don't, I'm not quite sure where it was originally, but it's decorated with two parrot, parrots. It was super cool. We estimated this pair of gates between 15 and 2,500. They sold for $3,500 at one of our auctions in Chicago. Um, here are some more pictures of the inside of Sorgate House, and you can see some of the rooms that we gave the new owners our advice on. I told them to keep these two chandeliers on the right. I told them to keep the one in the dining room, but I told them to get rid of this mirror because it's not right for a federal house. It belongs in a, a, a uh, second empire house, not a federal house. Because, because Villa, sorry, does someone have a question? I thought I heard someone speak. I'll, I'll come back to that at the end. I love to talk about David Adler because he's one of my favorite architects because Villa Terrace is a David Adler house and because we have so many great David Adler houses in the Chicago area. Here's one that we worked on a few years ago in Lake Forest, which you probably know is where Adler got most of his biggest commissions. The couple that owned this house were retiring and moving to California. We sold all of their furniture from the inside. Um, and I thought they did a really nice job of picking neoclassical and lightly European things that fit into a 1920s, 1930s revival house like a David Adler. Here is the back gardens of the house. It was on the lakefront. It had a private beach on Lake Michigan, super cool house. Um, I would love to go back now, five or eight years later and see what the new owners have done to it. The people who we were working with had a great collection. We sold this table for them, which is a nice late 19th century um, French table with bronze, marble, and porcelain in the empire taste. We estimated this between three and 5,000 and made $10,625. Great table for a house like the one I just showed you. Another Adler house that I had the privilege of seeing a couple years ago was this one. This was originally built for the Chicago and Lester Armour, who you've probably heard of, um, another meatpacking family. This house is also in Lake Bluff, not Lake Forest, but beautiful house with gardens that are legendary and an interior that's just as cool. Another of my favorite houses that I've worked on was the, the uh, Thomas Edward Wilson Mansion in Chicago in the Hyde Park neighborhood. This was built for the man who founded Wilson Sporting Goods and the people who sold it with whom we worked were only the third owners of the house. Um, the architect Howard Van Doren Shaw, who you've probably heard of, designed this house. And the interiors were phenomenally well preserved because these, this couple were, were only the third owners ever. The ceiling of the great room here with the fireplace that is so huge, you can't even tell how big it is from this picture. This ceiling is copied from a, a renowned country house in England. Um, and if I could say one thing negative about the collection, I think the rugs that they picked are not quite right for this house. These are 1920s Chinese rugs in kind of the Art Deco taste. Not what I would have picked for a Tudor house. Although they got it right in a few of the other rooms. This bench that you see here, we call these club fenders. 
Um, this is in front of the fireplace, and this is the kind of bench that you would have originally used to warm yourself sitting in front of the fire. We sold this bench for them, and it is really nice Tudor taste, I would say, with iron work, some of which is gold. This was estimated at 15 to 2,500 and made almost $6,000. Here's the outside of the house again. It was really beautiful and a lot bigger than you can tell from this picture. If you are lucky enough to live in a Tudor style house, I'm sure some of you live in Tudor or have lived in Tudor style homes, perhaps you should buy something like this uh, English court cupboard, which we sold a few years ago for the Toledo Museum of Art. This is from the late 1600s and made of oak carved with opposing horses on the middle and really nice decoration on each of the two shelves. This was estimated at three to 5,000 and made almost $7,000 as you can see. We sell English furniture from this time period all the time. So if you live in an English revival house, I hope you'll be in touch with me and let me help you buy something for it. Um, next, I will show you a really nice house in Lake Forest. Uh, English, but later than the period we were just copying. This is a good Georgian revival house with, whose contents we sold about three years ago. Not a David Adler, but very Adler in style and certainly from the area where Adler had some of his biggest commissions. This is another view of the same house from the front. The woman who lived here passed away and we sold her collection. Um, if you live in a Georgian revival house such as this, and I'm sure some of you do, there are a lot of them in Milwaukee, um, maybe you should buy something like this, which we sell all the time. On the left is a very nice George III case clock with red lacquer. This sold for $7,500 from the house I just showed you. Here's a pair of English cabinets painted with chinoiserie or Japan scenes, which as you know, the English loved back in the 1700s. If you live in a house like this, you must have a piece of chinoiserie furniture and it better be from the 1700s late or up to about 1820. These cabinets were probably circa 1810 or 1820. This was estimated at seven to 9,000. We sold this pair for $17,500. You must also have a good gold English mirror if you live in a house like this. Here's a very nice Regency bullseye mirror with shells at the top and the bottom. I love shells in the decorative arts. Um, this was estimated at four to 6,000 and sold for right in the middle of that range, $5,000. My favorite thing from this house, again, if you live in an English revival house, you have to have chinoiserie. This was a pair of six, a set of six Chinese paintings, awesome paintings. The detail on these was so incredible. The colors were so well preserved. And when you see these up close, you really appreciate the fantasy that was chinoiserie to the English in the 1700s. This set was estimated at 20 to 40,000 and made $37,500. Really cool set of paintings. Here's a house that needs a little love, but the new owner is in the process of restoring it, I'm told. If you live in a Queen Anne house like the Wood Maxie Boyd house in Chicago's Prairie Avenue district, you should absolutely be buying New York decorative arts from the 1870s through 1910. This is a cabinet attributed to the firm of Pottier and Stymus. If you know um, aesthetic movement decorative arts, you've heard of this firm. They were one of the leading New York makers of Victorian furniture, along with companies like Herder Brothers and so on. This cabinet was estimated at 8,000 to 12,000, sold for just a little more than 11 grand about five years ago. If you like this look, and if you live in a Victorian house, you should come to my auction in two weeks and bid on this cabinet which is also attributed to Pottier and Stymus. Really fine marquetry and bronze mounts that highlight the wood. This console cabinet is gonna start between 2000 and 4000. We'll see what it sells for later this month. I am offering it at auction on April 27th. Here's another example of a style you might be looking to furnish. If you live in the Pabst Mansion, which is probably the world's best example of Flemish Renaissance architecture, I love the dormers on the Pabst Mansion. It's one of the best houses in the Midwest, maybe in the country. Um, it reminds me a little of Biltmore in North Carolina sometimes. Um, if you live in a Flemish house like the Pabst Mansion, you should buy a clock like this. This is a super cool, and you can't tell from this picture how big it was, tortoise shell veneered clock, um, Flemish, probably from the late 1600s, which we sold a few years ago for $65,625. We sell smaller versions all the time if you're not looking to spend quite that much. Here's a really nice tapestry. If you live in a Flemish house, you have to have a good tapestry. 
This one was made in the late 1500s or early 1600s. We estimated this at 12,000. It made $35,000, probably because it was so well preserved in phenomenal condition and the colors were still so bright. Usually when we evaluate tapestries like this, they're badly faded or heavily repaired. The well-preserved condition of this one is part of why it sold for so much money. You have to have a Flemish cabinet if you live in a house like the Paps Mansion, although a cabinet like this would work in a lot of interiors. Burl wood is ne never gonna look out of place. This is a cabinet that we sold for the Toledo Museum of Art. It was estimated at $8,000 to $12,000 and made almost 9,000. So in case you didn't hear earlier, we do have a whole range of services available to museums. We have worked with museums all over the country. And I hope that one day when Villa Terrace needs to sell something, they'll think of me first. Um, the last example of a house that I wanted to show you is a house that we just sold the contents of recently, also a Wisconsin house. And I like to show this example because it demonstrates that you don't necessarily have to buy decorative arts that are the same style as the house you live in. I wonder if any of you knew Paul Bentley or if you're familiar with this house. It's in Oostburg on the lake. It has a private beach and the architect Margaret McMurray, uh, her, part, her partner in business was Stanley Tigerman from Chicago. This is a McMurray house that was built in the late 90s. It's known locally as the Crayola house. It's so cool, very postmodern, but the owner furnished it with an important collection of Americana and early folk art. And I love this house because it shows you that you can make historic objects look cool in a super modern setting. This man's house was veritably a museum of folk art and weird, wacky stuff. He had such a vision for collecting and saw the potential in strange objects that you would not otherwise think of as works of art. This is a view of his living room. Here's another view of the same room. And you can see how all over the house, even among very contemporary furniture, he had a historic folk art and objects. We sold this crazy Popeye, was it a riding toy, Sarah? I think it was a riding toy um, for $6,250. The sign on the left was one of my favorite things in the whole auction. It's a whale trade sign, probably from a shop or a restaurant, maybe in the Cape. Uh, we sold this for almost $6,000. And then the soup, by far the coolest thing of the sale was this bust of Daniel Webster which has traded hands at auction a couple of times over the last few decades. I'm happy to tell you that our firm got the highest price paid for this piece of anyone who has offered it in the last century. We estimated it at $6,000 to $9,000, sold for right at $15,000. Um, I, I love to show these because this is a category of collecting that a lot of people overlook, but you don't realize what an impact objects like this can make on an interior, even if you don't live in a federal or colonial American house. Those are a few of my favorite houses that I like to talk about. Um, and now if anybody has a question, I would be pleased to open it up and maybe I'll think of another story to tell you. Let me figure out how to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Corbin. When is your sale? It is on April 20th, sorry, April 21st and 22nd. The catalog is online now, so you can go to our website and look at everything that we have available. It's a very busy month for us. We're selling almost 2,000 lots this month of good European decorative arts. Um, I have a quick question. It seemed based on that presentation that um, you guys estimate low and then it sells quite a bit higher. Is that like your strategy? Is this like the... Like yes, just, um, I'll speak candidly and uh, people always ask that question after we give a presentation like this. We do, it is our strategy to estimate things low and let the market take things a little higher. It, they're, much like when you're a real estate agent and you're negotiating a deal with a new seller, there's an art and a dance to getting good objects for sale at the right price. And so, yes, that's a big part of what we do. We want to advertise things with prices that are just slightly below their true market value so that people get interested in bidding on them. If you take an object like one that I showed you and price it too high, people will say, no, that's too much money. I'm not interested in that. But if you price it a little bit low, then five people will bid on it instead of just one. And those five people competing against one another are what make it bring more money. Gotcha. Thank you very much.
Any other questions? Oops. Oh, hi, I, I'll jump in. This is Sarah Slaughter. Um, I have a quick question. I put my, ha my hand up and now I'll see if I can take that emoji off. There we go. Okay. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about any trends in the so-called brown furniture market, maybe like Amer American decorative arts, in particular, you know, the wonderful pieces that we may have now that are becoming antiques, um, but especially for American, um, American antiques that I think have seen a, a dip in the past. What are, what's the market looking like, looking like now? And maybe an extension of that is um, while we're keeping in mind what's appropriate for our houses, what would you, what, where would you say there are opportunities right now for value purchases um, that you've seen or what's, what's looking more and more popular? That's a great question. Um, so things are changed. I have, I've forced myself to stop using the term brown furniture because I think it does a disservice to fine historic furniture. Um, it's, it, everybody uses that term in our industry, but I'm trying not to because I think the furniture deserves better than that. I love brown furniture and I want all of it. We sell a lot of it and the prices have been inching upward probably 20 or 30% in the last few years. So if you like historic furniture made of mahogany or burl walnut, it's a good time to buy it because whatever you like, it will never in our lifetimes be this cheap to buy walnut and mahogany furniture from the 18th century. So if you, if you have room, fill your house with it. And the, the value of furniture like that has nowhere to go but up from where it is currently. I would say the biggest change in what people are collecting in brown furniture is um, the, the move away from shiny city mahogany toward grimy historic surfaces. And I can, if I share my screen again with you, I can show you an example of what's out versus what is in. Um, I gave another presentation not too long ago where I talked about, where I showed examples of exactly this. And I, let me, I don't know if I'm doing this right, but let me try this. I think this is it. Okay, so here's what I mean when I say shiny city mahogany furniture. Can you all see this chest? This is a, no, what am I doing wrong? Where is it? Can you see this chest now? Okay, now yes. I'm doing it right. Yes. Um, th this is a good federal chest, uh, but someone has probably refinished it in the late 1800s and, or early 1900s, and it's too glossy. And mm. this kills the value of the chest. So what people are actually looking for nowadays, and that's been a change over the last 15 or 20 years, is instead of a shiny city chest, they want a chest like this. Can you see this one? You see how it's dark, dull brown? And do you see how around the lock holes the, the wood is discolored, and that's because that area has received more wear than the rest of it. If you could see the top up close, you would see that there are water stains all over it and streaks and discolorations all over it. The feet are very dirty and scuffed and scratched. That's what people want now. So you don't want furniture that looks too perfect. You want furniture that shows its age and is a little bit messed up because every mark and scratch tells the story of the piece. Um, that's something that has changed a lot. We used to get very high prices for shiny city furniture, and now people want crusty country, country um, esoteric furniture. Hmm. Okay. Patina. Patina is very important. Um, and, I, and folk art, like the items I showed you from Paul Bentley's house, have also been a big opportunity for collectors in the last few years because we're talking about things that were not regarded as antiques or works of art until the last couple of decades. So um, it's a good time to buy things like that too. Interesting, thank you very much. Corbin, how is tramp art doing right now? Uh, you know, uh, let me, I might be able to show you a tramp art mirror I sold recently. The thing, tramp art is um, doing well. It, values are also coming up slightly. There's a lot of tramp art on the market, so that kind of keeps prices at a plateau. If something is going to be valued high, it has to be really unusual. So if you have the same kind of small tramp art box that we see a lot of, it's probably not doing so well. But if you have something unusual or sculptural, like a very big mirror that has an unusual shape, it's, it is doing very well. The last tramp art mirror I had came from a Los Angeles collection. Um, it was pretty big, and I think it made around $5,000 last year. I love tramp art. Thank you. Sure. 
Can you talk a little bit about other trends as far as because stickly furniture it was extremely hot, then it then dipped, and then it's I think it's come back up, and I'm not sure where it's at right now. But can you talk a little bit about what's dipping and what's actually hot at the moment? Yes. Um, can you talk a little um, bit about brown furniture or, or what we don't want to call brown furniture, um, things that have natural patina? Um, but can you talk about other things too, please? Sure. So I like to, I'm, I'm interested in arts and crafts like stickly furniture. I would say of all the areas we're talking about, that one remains the most depressed. Um, it's just such a niche category, kind of like French Art Nouveau. There aren't a lot of people interested in collecting it unless they live in an arts and crafts house, you know, a bungalow or a Frank Lloyd Wright house. Um, it's just a big commitment it, unless you're living in a house that calls for that kind of furniture. Same with Art Nouveau. If you, unless you live in a house in Paris that was built in 1910, you, you're going to look crazy having flamboyant Art Nouveau furniture in your house. It had a moment of resurgence in the 80s, but it has stayed pretty low recently. Prices are pretty low for Art Nouveau. Um, Stickly, there's a, a lot of variation in what's valuable, as you know, because they continued making it up until today. So it's really only the stickly from the early 1900s that has held its value. And that's probably what you have and what you're referring to. Um, although my area is not really mid-century and modern design, I think it's interesting to talk about what is hot in that area now. Um, you know that for like the last 15 or 20 years, mid-century modern has been the thing with people in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Well, mid-century modern is finally on the out. And now what people are collecting is 1970s, 80s, and 90s design, which is kind of crazy to think about. But let me share my screen again, and I'll show you an example. Um, people have finally, after 10 years, seen too much mid-century modern, and they're sick of it. So now instead of this kind of look, am I sharing my screen right? Let me try this again. Here, you can see that. So instead of this mid-century room, now people are going after this kind of look. This is a whole house filled with Memphis furniture. Memphis was um, a furniture manufacturer that employed a lot of Italian designers in the 80s and 90s. And I think this is ridiculous. This is the kind of furniture you would have thrown away 20 years ago, but the, most of what you see in this room was just offered at an auction in Chicago, another auction house, and brought huge prices. This chair, I think, made $30,000. This red cabinet in the back, I think, made $50,000. People are very eager to collect um, 80s and 90s design now. So that's another big change in what's hot versus what's not. Does anyone else think that looks like Pee Wee Herman's Playhouse? That's exactly what it is. <laughs> I mean, that is crazy. Yes, that's exactly what it is. <clears throat> How did it get the name Memphis? I remember it being from Italy, but, but it's just so weird that it's called Memphis. And I should know the answer to that, and I can't remember. If there's no connection to Memphis, Tennessee. I forgot why it was called the Memphis Design mm -hmm. Group, but they worked on uh, licenses with a lot of really famous Italian industrial designers and made furniture like this. Switching yeah. to pottery, how is Kempere doing these days? Oh, it's really weak. It's kind of sad. Um, I, I know a lady who, a great lady who lives in a beautiful French house in the Western suburbs of Chicago. She spent her whole life collecting Kempere. She has a beautiful collection. It just, after the advent of the internet, Kempere kind of lost its value because people realized there's too much supply and not enough demand. You, you know, value in the decorative arts is, exists because of rarity. And there's, although Campera is beautiful and I like it, there's just so much of it out there in the world that the prices don't go very high. Uh, it's really, it's really low. It, it hasn't come back up since probably the 90s. But isn't that a, uh, an issue that's happened since the internet has come about that we have an issue of deflated prices in so many different decorative arts because things that used to be so rare and you wouldn't find them except occasional antique shops or shows or whatever, now you could just go on the internet of eBay and other places and just find lots of it. Exactly right. The internet is the thing that killed the value of brown furniture too, because a, de a, a antiques dealer used to be able to sh illustrate that something was rare 
but now people can go on eBay and see that there are 10,000 other things like it available. Um, so when, when I explain the difference in value to people when they bought something 30 years ago before the internet, I have to help them understand that it's not that the value is down, it's that the market has reset itself since then and we shouldn't compare now to then because the world was just different 30 years ago than it is now. And values probably aren't ever gonna come back up to what they were in the 80s and 90s. So it's, it's best to just think of it as this is a new world and the market has reset itself and the value of things are, are what they are today and it doesn't help us to think about what they were 30 years ago. The internet changed the world forever and there's no going back. <clears throat> Any other questions? Alex, I thought you had a question. Yeah, I was thinking of my kids and wondering, you know, do you see like a generational shift for like millennials and Gen Z that they're just not interested in antiques the way people, you know, our parents' generation was or whatever and what, um, so that's question one. And I guess question two is, um, Who's making stuff today that's going to be the future collectibles, in your opinion? That's a good question. Uh, so to answer the first question, yes, millennials and Gen Z are absolutely becoming interested in antiques. Um, we, it, all the time when I have my auctions, there's, a, there's always, a, it's not a big crowd of new people, but there is always a crowd of new faces who are interested in learning and starting to buy stuff. And everybody starts their journey by buying one thing and then they see how fun it is and they come back to our next auction and they continue to buy more. It's not everybody, cer certainly millennials and Gen Z overall are less interested in collecting than their parents were, but they're interested. And now the older they get and the smarter they get, they start to realize how boring it is to have the same thing as everyone else. And they start to look for unusual objects to complement what they already have. Um, even if you, aren't interested in collecting, you know that you need a few antiques to make your house cool. Like a house with everything new is not interesting at all. And, and those younger generations like the thrill of having their friends over and having somebody ask what something is and be able to tell them a story about it. So it's happening. They're, they're, they're becoming interested. It, it's not happening as fast as we would like it to, but it takes time and education to appreciate antiques. You don't, you don't appreciate things until you spend a few years looking at them and learning about them. Um, and then I tell them they, that Ikea furniture is heavy and expensive. <laughs> yes, and it, and it doesn't cost any less than antiques does if you're buying at auction, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and then your other question was, what do I think the antiques of the future will be? That's a good question. I can't, what, Sarah, can you think of anything that we talk about as being an antique of the future? We, there, that definitely happens. Um, so here, here's one way I can answer that question, and you're not gonna like this, but sneakers are a category that auction houses will start to take seriously. Um, many auction houses already have sneaker auctions, and that's something that people collect, especially the younger generations. And I, I, I think it sounds ridiculous, but then if I stop and think about it, it's, no, it's not really any different than any other category of collecting, which used to be hot and is now not so hot. Over time, tastes change in what people like to collect. And sneakers will be antiques in 100 years. And if you have a rare pair of Nikes from the 80s that have never been worn, that is a valuable antique 75 years from now. What about computers and cell phones? Oh, big one. I mean, if the, if you have an Apple II GS, which was the, Apple's first um, mass-produced desktop computer, it's worth five figures today, it, easily $100,000 in some cases. The first iPhone, it, there are a lot of iPhones in the world, but in 100 years, when they're more rare, iPhones will be collectible. People are definitely interested in acquiring and collecting technology that they grew up with. The first Atari video game system can sell for huge money nowadays. Um, the first uh, Nintendo game system, definitely collectible. There are people who are interested in buying stuff like that. Any other questions for Corbin? 
I'm thinking of things that are more intrinsically beautiful, though, than <laughs> that's what I like to talk about. Atari too. or whatever. <laughs> so do, do you, you know, are there like furniture manufacturers that are still making high quality stuff? Are there glass makers that are still blowing, you know, glass that's collectible? There definitely are. Um, there's. Um, what about like Christopher Fitz? William Lamps. Christopher right? Spitzmiller, that's yeah. a good example. There, there's a very famous ceramicist in New York named Christopher Spitzmiller who's making very high quality ceramics these days and doing amazing things with glazes that nobody else is doing. A lot of his pottery gets turned into lamps and so interior designers kind of have a cult following with him, but that's a great example. Spitzmiller ceramics, when he stops making them after he's gone, will be hugely collectible and probably very valuable. Um, there's a manufacturer of furniture that they used to sell in Barney's um, called RNY Agusti. They make um, furniture out of wood that's lacquered and then they use stingray skin to veneer it. It's, it's kind of mass produced. They probably make it in China, but I still think it's cool and the quality is pretty good. I see RNY Agusti as a brand name that will have a cult collectible following in 20 years after they're no longer around. Um, Certainly there's silver being made today that will be collectible for a long time. Bucciolati silver is some of the best in the world that you can buy. They, they, there's so much work and artistry that goes into making Bucciolati silver sculptures. Those have to be um, solid in terms of keeping their value. Um, what's another furniture maker that I can think of? Corbin, were there any furniture makers I'm thinking from the Springborn collection that we just- Oh, that's a fabulous example. And I can show you something else. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so the, in addition to 80s and 90s design, the whole new, the new thing that's hot in um, collecting modern furniture is what they call the studio craft movement. Do you all know about that? This is stuff that was made in the 70s and 80s, um, as opposed to mass produced like that Memphis furniture. These are, this is bench made fine woodwork that um, artists like George Nakashima made. A lot of it took place in Pennsylvania. Let me show you a couple examples of what I mean when we talk about studio craft. Um, sharing my screen. This is a good one. I think you can see this now. So Wendell Castle is a contemporary furniture maker. Can you see this ugly, weird purple green chest? Okay. Wendell Castle just died about two years ago. So he was making furniture in the early 2000s and in the late 90s. And everything he makes is a wacky, amorphous blob like this. But the way he made the stuff was so fine that it, it became collectible. The woods are expensive and exotic and stained these fantasy colors. Um, a lot of work and money went into making this furniture. So it's basically furniture as sculpture. And even though it's not old, this is absolutely becoming an antique of the future. Uh, there is another designer who's a lot like Wendell Castle called Philip Lloyd Powell. And do I have a picture of a Philip Lloyd Powell piece? I thought I did. I guess I don't, but Wendell Castle is a great example of something like that. Let me look at one of my other speeches I gave recently. I think I have a, here's a Philip Lloyd Powell. This is a bar cabinet that we sold. Same kind of movement. Can you see this wacky thing? You open these wood doors up and it, inside it has bottles and shelves. It's a bar. Um, and this is a, a furniture maker who made this in the 1980s. But now that he has passed away, his work is collectible. And this will be an antique in 50 years. And we sold this just three years ago for a, almost $100,000. Um, Wharton Escherich is a studio craft furniture maker from the early 20th century. I think he was active in the 30s. Cranbrook Museum in Birmingham, Michigan has this set of bed steps. Again, bench made, fine studio furniture. Not what we think of as an antique traditionally, but it's becoming antique and it's already super valuable. So the studio craft movement is one to pay attention to for sure. I could also ask about what to do about grandma's China and uh, give it to the kids who are setting up their first apartment. Silver things and stuff like that. Is it ever going to come back? I don't think so. Silver, <laughs> um, 
the world has just changed too much. If, if you have historic silver that was made before World War II, yes, that never lost its value and it still has its value. But all the silver that we inherited from our mothers and grandmothers, nobody wants it. Um, you know, if you like it, use it. That's what I say, put it in the dishwasher, enjoy using it every day. It's probably not ever gonna regain its value again. Obviously there are exceptions. If you have Tiffany silver, that's a different story. Tiffany silver will always be valuable, but most of the silver that's out there, probably not ever coming back. What about China? Same thing. People want plain China that they can put in the dishwasher. The people just don't live like they used to. They don't have the help that they used to have. And our lifestyles don't allow us to use fine, fragile things in that way. Well, it's 7.30. So unless there are any other questions for Corbin, I think we should, should say good night. Thank you so much, Corbin. That was so was fascinating. Fun. And um, thank you for being such a good friend to Villa Terrace. We all I look, look forward, forward to, to I look forward to helping you again with your next gala. Oh, thank you. We will definitely call you and maybe we can put together something sooner like we were talking about earlier, like a, um, a day at Villa Terrace to get your antiques at praise, but we'll be in talk. And we also will all be uh, present for your April, what was it, 21st and 22nd sale? Yes, the catalog is online now, go take a look. Okay, and then- um, Is there an admission charge for this, attending those or? What's the question? Is there an admission charge to attend those? No, uh, the auctions are open to everyone. Okay. Great. So um, I think we'll say goodbye now. And then um, on Wednesday, April 21st, we will welcome Jen Current our, to speak about Renaissance garden design. Hope all of you can attend that. And thanks again, Mr. Horn. And thank you also, Sarah. Um, what a fascinating evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. very much, Bye. both Sarah and Corbin. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.